वेलकम टू अनिल अग्रवाल डायलॉग 2025 टुडे वी हैव डॉक्टर प्रणव चंचानी जी ही इज हेड ऑफ स्पीसीज कंजर्वेशन एट डब्ल्यू डब्ल्यू एफ इंडिया आई जस्ट वॉन्टेड टू आस्क इज वाइल्ड लाइफ लिमिटेड ओनली इन द प्रोटेक्टेड एरियाज ऑफ इंडिया इट इज इट ऑल्सो आउटसाइड बिकॉज वी सी मेनी इंस्टेंसेज ऑफ टाइगर एंड एनिमल कॉन्फ्लिक्ट आउटसाइड प्रोटेक्टेड एरियाज लार्जेस्ट पॉपुलेशन ऑफ टाइगर्स एंड एलिफेंट्स आर डेफिनेटली इन साइड सम वेल इस्टेब्लिश प्रोटेक्टेड एरियाज uh there are other protected areas that have been around for many decades but don't support uh, populations of these species anymore you know these species are distributed across other forest types as well including reserve forests uh, community managed forests and they also occur uh, outside of forests in human dominated landscapes including in agricultural land plantations tea and coffee plantations for example and so on so now when you are saying that these animals venture out of their protected areas or forest areas they go habitat and into agriculture land for example what are the uh, reasons and what are the consequences of uh, human animal conflict uh, then so these interactions happen under a variety of circumstances and they informed by diverse factors for one there's geography there are there may be certain geographical features for example rivers that attract both humans who are practicing agriculture along river basins and valleys but these areas also are also attractive to wildlife and the, these areas have been lost to wildlife because they've been converted over time to um, areas of agriculture and so on so as the interface between people and wildlife grows so to the, to the number of interactions and while many of these interactions are relatively benign uh, undoubtedly um, wild animals will uh, you know they'll um, raid crops they'll predate on crops mm-hmm. um, large carnivores will predate on livestock uh, tigers and elephant have a propensity to uh, come into close contact with people um, which can result in people being injured or, or even killed so over time we know that when people incur losses they will try and redress their losses uh, through all available recourse including pursuing these animals sometimes attempting to injure or kill animals and so on and so the role of the state and other uh, actors becomes really important to try and um, uh, manage uh, the human wildlife interface um, equitably uh, justly and effectively so what could be uh, the changes at policy level that the government could do to minimize these conflicts and also um, enable coexistence there are uh, several options and and uh, these are you know often uh, location specific um but uh, at the onset i should say these solutions need to be devised by a set of stakeholders the government being the most important stakeholder but ultimately by communities themselves who um, you know need to decide what acceptable levels of risk are for them in terms of coexisting with wildlife um this being said uh, several measures can be put in place for example in the case of elephants uh, or for tigers and the sundarbans barriers have proved to be an effective means of keeping animals out of areas where they pose a lot of risk to people or to crops and so on but barriers are not the solution everywhere for example in some sites uh, there are important corridors and placing a barrier in the wrong place would actually prevent animal movement uh, between two national parks or, or, two, or two areas where such movement is desirable um so barriers are one part of the solution but in other contexts i think effective um, zonation not just in the forest but outside recognizing that animals will uh, venture outside forests or recognizing that these areas need to be managed as so called zones of coexistence where uh, uh, you know when animals uh, venture out there are effective mechanisms in place to um, preempt conflict to warn people who may be at risk um to to uh, to repel animals and and safely drive them back to the habitats where that's desirable or to permit animals to be and use these spaces while reducing costs for people and uh, one way to think about it is having a uh, multiple safe safety nets so to speak both for wildlife and for people so safety nets for people will include uh, early warning systems in uh, valparai uh, which is a region in, in tamil nadu there was a lot of conflict with elephants and a local ngo the ncf created an early warning system where elephants would be spotted by observers uh, and sms messages would be sent out to uh, people in um, localities where elephants were visiting or were likely to, uh, to occur and human deaths went down uh, radically since this intervention was put in place so that's an example of a safety net for people but uh, you know expatriate payments and compensation is another level of uh, of safety nets having mechanisms 
by working with and supporting local communities to tolerate the presence of these animals and provide safe passageways back for them to habitats or areas where they can uh, be without uh, being at risk. I think it was quite interesting even the presentation. Yeah, thank you all very yeah, much. Thank you. Thank you.